So thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to be talking about software integration, the headaches you can have when you have to build software from source, and two recent developments in the space of integrating software, one of them being BuildStream, the new version of BuildStream, and the other being the remote execution API. So the basic problem we have uh, since the 1950s is this. We have some source code, which uh, it's the 1950s, so maybe it's written in Fortran. And we want to produce binaries that we can run on a computer. So we have to run a compiler. And so far, so easy, but nothing stays simple in software for long. So now we have a whole load of source code. And we need to run different compilers. And we need to link it all together to before we can run our program. So this process becomes fragile if you have to do it manually. Maybe I make a change here. Um, but then I forget to run this stage, so now I've changed this, but this is at the wrong version, and I'm testing for a bug that doesn't exist. So fast forward to the 1970s. Um, disco music is big in the 1970s, and it's the golden age of Unix, let's say. And people are sick of having the problem of, I forgot to compile this, and I'm testing the wrong thing. So a tool named Make was developed. It was, we could say it was the first popular build tool. And make solved this problem by describing this file depends on that file, this file depends on that file, in a way that a machine could understand. So you outsource the problem of building software to a machine. Great, so make solves this problem of tracking dependencies between what file depends on what. But it doesn't solve every problem related to integrating software. Maybe I've got different teams working in different places. Um, Make doesn't solve that for you. And maybe I built something on one computer, and it worked fine. But then I built it on a different computer. The compiler version is different, and now it doesn't work. And Make doesn't solve that for you either. So fast forward to the 1990s. Uh, Friends is massive, and the open source community really gets going, and the free software movement. And so for the first time, we've got distributed teams working on software. Maybe there's a team. Um, working on the kernel, and a team working on the compiler over here, and a team working on the desktop. And it becomes more important than ever to be able to integrate different components together. And the solution we came up with was packaging tools initially, things like dpackage, RPM. And these solve some of the remaining issues, right? So you can integrate multiple repos together using packaging tools. Generally, these days, you can also do repeatable builds. So it doesn't come for free, but most distributions will build packages in a way that um, it works the same, regardless of which, which machine you run it on. But the dependency tracking is different. So if you make a change to one source file in your Linux kernel source code, for example, the packaging tool is going to rebuild the whole kernel, which might take an hour. So in the end, you're still using make when you're working on a component, and then packaging tools when you're working on integration. And then fast forward to today, there's been loads more innovation in the world of integration tools. Now we have meta build tools, which are similar but different to packaging tools. We have containers and container build tools. Uh, we have continuous integration, which I'm not even going to begin on in this talk. So everything's solved, right? We have all the tools we need to integrate software. We just need to find what's the best tool to use. What's the one tool to rule the, all of the tools in the integration world? So 10 years ago, maybe I'd have said, oh, here's, a, here's a perfect tool to use. But what I've realized is that there isn't one tool that solves all the problems a software integrator might have. And let's go back to the 1970s, to the philosophy of one program focusing on doing one thing well. And let's instead ask, how can the existing tools we have work together and with that, I'm going to bring up the Remote Execution API. Out of curiosity, how many people know what I'm talking about when I say the Remote Execution API? A few. Good, because I'm going to start from the beginning. So the basic idea, this was introduced by the team working on the Bazel build tool. They wanted a way to send build results to a cache and send builds to a build farm. And they thought, well, why don't we make this a standard so that other tools can collaborate on the same infrastructure? And that's a really key insight, because up till now, 
build tools and integration tools haven't really collaborated at all. And the key ideas are content address storage. This is really crucial. We've had content address storage for a long time now. Git is a great example that each commit is addressed by the contents of the commit. So you know if one commit is the same as another because it has the same hash. And we can apply that to builds as well. If you hash a binary, then you can say, well, this binary is the same as this binary because the hash is the same. But it goes further because you don't have to identify the binary by its own hash. You can hash the source code and the instructions used to build it and apply that to the binary. And as long as you've controlled all of the inputs, then you can look at the inputs and say, OK, this is the same binary corresponding to the inputs. We don't need to build it again. So that's really the key insight. The other thing the RE API standardized is a way to request builds from a build farm and a way to have a shared results cache. And by shared, I mean it could be on one server and you pull things to a, another machine. So these are the building blocks of a lot of different integration pipelines. To go into a little more detail, I think I've got time to expand a bit more. This is how a theoretical regular build tool might work. Let's say make, for example. You say, I want to build something. And it looks at the inputs, the source codes, the dependencies. It runs the build locally, and you get your binary. And if you tell it to build again on a different machine, it'll build it again. So when we look at the remote execution API, this model changes slightly. So we have the same inputs, source code, dependencies, and the build configuration. But we first hash all of that to come up with what's called a cache key. And then we can look in the cache and say, do we have any binaries matching this cache key? And if we do, then we can fetch it from the cache. We don't need to build again. And if we don't, we run a local build. Uh, we can push it to the cache, and then we're done. There's a couple of important things here. One is that the cache and the build don't need to happen, happen locally now. They can happen, uh, the cache can be on a remote server. The build could be a build farm. The other thing is very important that this captures all the inputs, because otherwise we might not notice when something important has changed. And to ensure that things are fully reproducible, we must run the build in a controlled sandbox environment. So when I say a sandbox, think something like a container. So we control what devices are available. We limit network access. Um, for example, we might set the time to a fixed time to avoid the time affecting the build output. And that allows us to trust the cache and know that we really don't need to build again as long as the inputs haven't changed. So that, I think, is the key insight of the remote execution API. This is, so the thing came out of Google, right? So this, there wasn't a huge fanfare when it was announced. It was just a message on Google Groups. And there was a link to, initially, the standard was kept in a Google document. Nowadays, the standard lives on GitHub. Um, there's the repo. And the actual implementation, like the standard is defined as a set of protobufs. So if you want to see what exactly is the remote execution API, the answer is in this file, um, which is a, a protobuf definition. And then that can be compiled to a load of different languages. A build tool that supports the remote execution API is called a client. This is a list from the README. And there are six tools that we know of right now that are supporting the RE API. And they fall into some different categories. The simplest, in a way, are the top two, Goma Server and Rec. They replace um, a compiler. So they're a drop-in replacement for your C, C++ compiler. And very easy to integrate because you just, as with the older tools, C cache and disk CC, all you need to do is make them available on the system running the build, um, call it CC, and make will run REC instead. And like C cache and like disk CC, they will look at the source files, and if a build already exists in the cache of that um, C C++ source file, it'll download the object file instead of building it locally. And 
Altern alternatively, it can distribute it to a build farm to run the compile rather than building it locally. So these, these are the simplest to get started with. They're drop-in replacements for compilers. But they don't solve any of the problems we have around software integration, right? They don't deal with dependency tracking or uh, making sure builds are repeatable or integrating different components together. So let's look now at what I would call the build tools. You can compare them to make or anything else from that sort of 1970s build tool category. So they track dependencies at the level of individual files. Bazel, pants, and please. They're all variations on the design of Bazel. The story of Bazel is that it's a build tool internal to Google called Blaze. And various people over the last 10 years left Google and thought, oh, we really miss having Blaze available. And so they implemented it from scratch various times. And in parallel, Google worked to open source Bazel. So now we have three or four different tools built around the same model. Different strengths and weaknesses to each one. Um, I personally think pants is the most interesting, but I um, personally haven't used that many of them. In general, they solve the problem of making builds repeatable. I've put partly for some of them because they don't sandbox things. Certainly, Bazel and pants don't do what I would call strong sandboxing. They will copy a source file to a new directory and that's it. They won't isolate it from device nodes or network access or anything else. So there are more ways you can introduce indeterminability into the build with Bazel and Pants. And they also, these tools are all designed around the idea of a monorepo. So the monorepo is this idea that all your source code in a whole company is kept in one big version control repo. And if that's how your company works, then perfect, you can adopt one of these tools. But in the open source world, we generally don't work like that. And integrating um, a project with lots of dependencies using Bazel can be a headache because you need to wrap. Each third-party dependency needs to be declared for Bazel to understand it. And that gives you a lot of extra maintenance work. So these tools can be useful. They're definitely worth investigating. But they have a cost to getting started. Of course, also, if you already have a build system, you need to rewrite it so that Bazel, Pants, or Please can understand the dependencies. And that can be a lot of work. Say you want to build GCC with Bazel, good luck. You're going to first have to rewrite um, 20,000 lines of automake and autoconf. So the final tool category is that of integration tools. These are des designed, you could also think of them as package tools, although they work on more than just packages. So these work on the idea that we'll build a whole component using its existing build system. So we could build GCC, for example, using its existing build system. Um, Buildstream is the only tool in this category right now that supports the remote execution API. There are plenty of other tools that don't. Um, Bitbake, Buildroot um, are the most common examples. You could possibly put Docker build in this category as well, although that's another, another discussion. And Buildstream solves pretty well the point, the problem of making builds repeatable because it has quite strong sandboxing. Your build happens in a container with quite limited access to the outside world. It solves the problem of integrating from different places and uh, different repos. But the catch is because it doesn't have this knowledge of the file by file dependency level, if you make a change in one element, you have to rebuild the whole thing. So if you're building WebKit and you change the readme file, Buildstream's going to go, OK, the source code is in new commit, so I'm going to rebuild from source. And you have to wait for a whole WebKit rebuild, even if you change the readme file. So that's the trade-off. Um, no, neither of these tools are perfect, but that's, that's the trade-off. Some things to be aware of. When I ask my colleagues that are Bazel experts how they feel about Bazel, I got some mixed reactions, let's say. So I already talked about how you have to rewrite the project build system to make use of Bazel, and that it can be a pain to integrate third-party dependencies. It also doesn't have a plugin mechanism. So if you want to build a language which isn't already supported, that can be tricky. It's because of its nature that it's, there's a closed source version of it inside Google and an open source version of it. It's tricky to upstream stuff, because the team maintaining it have to keep both versions in sync. 
So it can be very, very difficult to land stuff upstream compared to a regular open source project. Um, by far the biggest complaint, though, is that the command line interface has 100 options. You run bazel-help, and it gives you just a screenfuls of text. So um, check it out, but check out the other tools as well, because maybe they'll be more suited. Of course, Buildstream isn't magic either. Um, I already mentioned the main downsides. But as well, the sandboxing can never be perfect, right? So the aim of the sandbox is to guide your builds to being reproducible, ideally bit for bit reproducible. But nothing is foolproof. If you want to implement a random number generator in your build based on the time of, of the, the git commit, for example, then you can. And there's nothing we can do to stop that. So it's a guide to making reproducible builds, but it can never be perfect. So that's the client side of the remote execution API. Let's talk a little bit about infrastructure, because the whole point here is we have a separation between the build tools on one side and the build farms and the caching services on the other side. You can plug and play, as it were. So you're not restricted to using one specific cache, for example. There are three big projects that are developing infrastructure. Uh, build farm being one, build barn, and build grid. All of them are easy to spot because their names all start with build. Um, and they have fairly similar capabilities. All of them support caching to different backends, either a local disk or a sharded Kubernetes setup or a Amazon S3 API. All of them support running commands on a machine. Although build grid has support for some extra features, such as running inside a specific container. Um, so that can be worth looking at. They have different implementation languages. So if you prefer Python, obviously look at build grid. The last two, please servers and scoot, I've included for completeness, but they don't provide a full capabilities compared to the others. Please servers is designed just for use with please, and scoot is just a build farm without a, a cache. So they, they provide less overall. These are all worth checking out. The downside is, firstly, they can all be quite difficult to deploy. So in, a, in an enterprise where you have Kubernetes experts to hand, no problem. They'll be able to set it up for you. In an open source project, if you wanted to set up a build farm setup, for example, you're going to burn through a lot of volunteer time, maybe, unless you have someone on hand that enjoys spending their weekends coming up with Kubernetes pod deployments. So I would like to see better documentation and some easier ways to deploy this infrastructure. Protobufs work fine, but they have some um, issues, let's say. Sometimes the, the protobuf package in common distros has a bug that may um, cause a crash, for example. So in the Buildstream project, we end up bundling a specific version of protobufs in order that we and static linking against that so we can be sure that it works because we had a lot of problems of, oh, it crashes on Fedora 36. And it turns out the version of protobufs in Fedora 36 is broken and um, no one's fixed the bug yet. And it's kind of tricky to fix bugs as well, because it's another project where the development isn't completely in the open. So you look at the commit history, and there's one commit which has 200 um, things lumped together without much details of what went on. So it's not super easy to contribute to Protobus either. Um, that is what it is. Mostly it works fine, and any standard is better than no standard. My other tip for working with remote API caches is treat it as a cache. If the cache disappears tomorrow, your build should still work. Don't think, ah, we can, we c as long as we rely on this existing in the cache forever, then um, we can use it for releases or whatever. Don't do that because cache expiry then becomes way more difficult. You don't know what you can expire and what you can't expire. So if you're setting up a cache, make sure that you can delete the whole contents of the cache and your builds are slower, but they're unaffected. OK. Um, I'm going to finish talking about the Remote Execution API now. My last slide is about what I would like to see. I'd like to see more build tools supporting it, because I think many could. Imagine a world where distributions could share some common infrastructure. Um, Debian and Red Hat-based distributions could share tools. This is an optimistic idea, maybe, but I don't see in principle why it couldn't happen. Um, 
I'd like to see BuildStream get faster to work with um, when you're a developer. At the moment, it's great for integrators, but it's not optimized for people who are making changes every day to a specific element because you have to rebuild from source every time you make a change in most cases. And on the infrastructure side, again, I'd like to see wider support. I think Artifactory in particular would be fantastic if it supported RE API caching because a lot of organizations already have an Artifactory. So you could get this for free, effectively. And like I said, I'd like to see easier deployment. So this talk's kind of divided in two. Uh, I think just at halfway mark of the talk as well, so timed perfectly. In the second half, I'm going to focus specifically on BuildStream, which, as you've already seen, is kind of the first tool of its category to support the remote execution API. If you've not heard of it, it's a like I say, an integration tool, comparable to BuildRoot or BitBake in some ways. It's open source. It's recently become part of an Apache Foundation project. And the 2.0 release, which is due imminently, the 2.0 release is ready and is waiting on some final approval within Apache. And it's going to be out in a couple of weeks. So the, the latest unstable tag is actually going to be the 2.0 release. It's just waiting on some some Apache Foundation paperwork. So the build stream itself dates from around 2016. So the design kind of predates the remote execution API being public. But it already had a similar design of strong caching, where we hash the inputs and we avoid rebuilding if the inputs haven't changed. And the motivation for the 2.0 release and the, the internal changes that led to going from 1 to 2 are redesigning it around the existing RE API standards, so re-implementing the core to support um, the, the standard rather than coming up with its own protocol. Like the 1.0 series had its own custom cache server and things like that, which isn't needed anymore. The mascot of BuildStream is the BuildStream Beaver, because build the Beavers obviously build things in streams. And also, the original developer is Canadian. So it fits perfectly as a mascot. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into the details of using it, but I'm going to show a little bit. I've just realized the text here is probably too small and too black to read. So let me, rather than show you this slide, I'm going to go into a terminal and show you here. This is an example project, which is building GNU Hello. So it has three elements. And the final element is this one called hello.bst. Look at that. It fits on the screen perfectly. So you've spotted that elements are defined as YAML files. An element is a, a unit that corresponds more or less to a package, although it doesn't have to be a, a package. It can be an image or an app or anything. And we specify, firstly, that we use the auto tools element plugin. So that means we don't have to specify run, configure, and make, because this element plugin already brings in uh, defaults that do that. Um, we modify the configuration here so that uh, configure and make runs inside this subdirectory, um, which is specific to the GNU hello package. And then we specify the source. Uh, it's a tar file. It comes from this alias URL. And this is the content hash of the tar file, so that we know that we're getting what we want. And of course, the build happens in a container in the sandbox. And so by default, there's nothing in there. There's no compilers, nothing. So we need some sort of base to build on top of. And for this simple example, the base is an Alpine Linux uh, container. So this element is an import element. And it's importing another tar file, which is some pre-built binaries from Alpine Linux. The final part of the project is the project configuration. So here, we import some plugins, um, such as a, a Git source plugin and the AutoTools plugin. We define URL aliases, which is just a good practice, so that if, if you want to use a mirror, a different mirror, then you don't have to rebuild, because uh, the alias hasn't changed. And we specify that we need BuildStream 2.0. And since I'm here, I guess I can show you a build. I'm running BuildStream from a VM because that's how you install 1 and 2 in parallel. 
you don't normally have to install it in a VM if you don't want to. There's a build. Very fast, right? What's happened is I already built this. So what it's done is it's worked out the cache key based on all of the inputs and the configuration. And it's checked in the local on disk cache. And it said, this is already present. So I don't need to build it. So to make this a slightly more interesting demo, what I can do is delete the existing artifacts from the cache. And now they're gone. And now when I run the build, it's going to build from sus. So this is actually running the GNU hello build command. And there we go. That was still pretty fast. Quite a small package, but um, all done. And I can now check out my hello element. One thing that might be a little surprising is the checkout is not just a binary. The checkout is the whole sandbox. So that includes the Alpine base container. So to demo it, what I actually have to do, um, yeah, I did this before and realized that I also need to specify a different shell. I'll cheroot in there and just show you that, indeed, here's, here's a Hello World program. And if we look in etc. OS release, it just confirms that I'm not lying when I say it's an Alpine Linux base. So of course, you can, if you're building an application, for example, you don't want to check out a whole operating system with it. You would do that by creating a separate element that doesn't include the base. So there's a type of element which can deploy your application in a certain way. Um, for example, building an RPM package or a Flatpak app. And then you would check out that, and it would be separate from the base. So that's, that's the gist of BuildStream. Uh, these are the illegible slides. And the last thing I want to do is give a couple of case studies of how BuildStream is being used in real world open source projects. How many people use the flat, Flatpak app? I don't know how to describe it, Flatpak app runtime. Everyone here I'm hoping has a Linux desktop and the best way to get apps on a Linux desktop these days is with Flatpak. And most of the apps you'll encounter in the real world are using a base, which is the free desktop SDK runtime. And the free, so this is a big project. It's being deployed on the you know, millions of Linux desktops in the world that are running Flatpak apps. And it's built with BuildStream. So a little bit about the free desktop SDK. Like I said, it's a runtime and an SDK for building Linux apps. It has about 600 components for four architectures. It's mostly powered by volunteers. It does have some sponsors for infrastructure and some development. But it's mostly volunteer powered, which means the development process has to be super efficient, right? And to achieve that, they use a combination of GitLab CI to automate as much testing as possible and BuildStream. So here's an example pipeline for a random commit. The commit is updating this package, this Python package. And it's built for four. Again, this is a slightly illegible, but it's built here for four architectures. ARM 64, um, Intel 32 and 64-bit, and RISC 5 64-bit. And the results of these builds are pushed to the remote RE API cache that the Free Desktop SDK project hosts. So this is gigabytes of stuff that gets built here. And then the next step, you can build some virtual machines just for testing. But imagine passing five gigabytes of binaries from one GitLab pipeline to another. That could be slow. But using the RE API cache, it's much faster because even if these builds happen on separate runners, it's pulling from the cache on the second build. And the cache is local to the GitLab runners. So it all works pretty quickly. And there's not really a need to build from scratch because of the strong caching, unless they change like, something in the bootstrap. Then updating this Python package will only rebuild the things that depend on it. And the updates themselves are actually automated. So this is an automatically generated merge request, which updated the version tag in the YAML file using another feature of BuildStream, which allows tracking upstream tags and branches. So the processes they have set up are pretty efficient and can be you know, looked after in even when someone's only got a weekend to, to look at it. Also, 
Because there's a shared cache, some downstream projects that make use of the SDK, uh, one example being GNOME, can use the same cache. So they can junction their build stream project to the free desktop SDK. And they don't have to build everything from source again, because they can pull the stuff that was built in this CI from the remote API cache. So that saves loads of time building compilers in the downstream projects, as long as they're happy using the same versions. So that's my first case study. The second one is a little bit different. This is some work on safety that CodeThink has been looking at for the last few years. So Linux is everywhere these days. It's in quite dangerous devices, such as cars, um, which is scary, right? Uh, you write a bug in uh, the kernel, and who knows what, what could happen. So a question a lot of people are asking, how can we use you know, the existing open source tools that we have but in a way that can be proved to be safe. And DCS, the Deterministic Construction Service, is a stepping stone towards that. So what the DCS achieved is a method for certifying the build process of some software. Now, none of the ideas in it are new. In fact, it's a lot of the same ideas that I talked about in the beginning with the RE API, with strong caching, and knowing that if you hash all of the inputs to a build and sandbox the build, then you can be sure you're getting the same thing out the other side. What the DCS project was about is wording that in such a way that it can be actually certified, and which is important, right? Because if you're going to certify the result, if you're going to test your software, you need to know that the thing you're testing is going to be the same when it's deployed. So this is the first part of making Linux and cars fully testable and safe, but it's an important part. DCS is a design pattern, so it doesn't, in principle, require any specific build tool, but it does require a build tool or an integration tool that can do repeatable builds. And the repeatable builds allow us, basically, to certify what we care about, which is that we can update or modify the build tools being used and check that it hasn't affected the build output. So in the case of BuildStream, we can use a new version of BuildStream, and we can certify that it's produced the same binaries as the previous version. So OK, we know that that's not introduced any new issues. Or if it has, if something has changed, we can analyze, OK, why has this changed? So the reference implementation of DCS uses BuildStream. There's nothing specific to BuildStream in the design. It's just, at the moment, it's the easiest path to achieve what's needed. So um, other tools can implement this pattern, and I would like to see that. But I suspect it'll be more work than what was done for the reference implementation. The, refer the, the reference implementation of DCS was certified back in June to the automotive safety standard with a very catchy number, 26262. Um, so that's kind of proved that the design pattern is sound. And if you want to hear more about safety certification, specifically about the next steps, like now we've built this software, how do we actually test that the software is safe? My colleague Paul Albatella is doing a talk on Friday on that topic. So I recommend you can have a look at that. And if you're not aware, the Linux Foundation has lots of other projects going on around this area as well, under the, the umbrella of ELISA which I've forgotten what it stands for. The S stands for safety, I can tell you that much, and the L for Linux. So this is my last slide. I think we've got a little bit of time left for questions. Indeed, we have. Um, I want to say, obviously, enjoy integrating. Please invest in your build and integration pipeline, because uh, your engineers will be sad if you don't. And take a look at the remote execution API. And take a look at BuildStream. The, the 2.0 release is coming, and hopefully it's a um, a, an interesting build tool. I want to I wanna say that the, the ideas in BuildStream are almost more important to me than the actual implementation. The, the current implementation is nice and it's fun to use, um, but really the ideas are what are interesting. The idea of having strong caching and being able to trust that your build is fully repeatable. That's what's interesting. So I hope that next time I give this talk, I can go back to my slide comparing our API clients, and I can list some more tools under there. That's my dream.
OK, thanks a lot for coming. And if you've got any questions, we have uh, a few minutes left. Five minutes, indeed. I see a question here. Do we have a microphone for because getting your question? <laughs> okay. So, uh, have you tried to clear stuff like the Chromium using the stream? Uh, yeah, interesting. So the question was, have we tried building Chromium with build stream? I think Chromium we haven't, but WebKit we certainly have. So the free desktop SDK includes WebKit. And the results are on x86, great. On ARM, takes up, how long does it take on ARM? Oh, OK. Yeah, so the experience is good. Um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it for developing WebKit at this stage, because um, you don't want to have to rebuild everything every time you make a change. But for integrating something like WebKit or Chromium, it works well. The key, I think, is to have a fast enough build machine. And of course, that's something where both GitLab CI and the Remote Execution API can help, because you can kind of have one big build machine and then say, OK, this element needs to go on the big one. Uh, another question here. Yeah, that's what is the question to the, <laughs> the fire end, because I was struggling with making a build system on my manual system. So my question is, can we uh, link the Docker stuff into that build stream? Because what I'm doing manually is just to get the base Docker image and put the API OK, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, to paraphrase whether you can import Docker images. And the answer is you can. There is a plugin that can import um, Docker or OCI images. And I think there's another plugin that can produce images. Certainly, it can produce a rootFS that you can use with Docker import. So you can. Um, the difference maybe from Docker build is because there's no network access in the sandbox, you have to declare in advance all the things that are going to be needed. So for example, if your build process requires a C++ compiler, you can't yum install your C++ compiler and then remove it again. Um, you have to make it available at the start, uh, which is fine, of course. The way to solve that is to either install it in the image you import, yep. um, or you can also import tools from the free desktop SDK, so you can junction build stream projects together. And that's another way to get hold of compilers and tool chains. But yeah, I'm, inter I'm interested to chat after you, to chat to this after if you want more, yeah. more information. Uh, a question here. OK, yeah, so the question is, what's to stop BuildStream han handling both element-level dependencies and file-level dependencies? Which is something, yeah, we've thought about quite a bit. The main obstacle is if you want to accurately know all of the file-level dependencies, you have to have some knowledge of the existing build system, um, which can be tricky. If it's a make file, for example, um, it's not easy to just interrogate make and say, give me the dependency graph. So the thing, I'd say that the, the main thing stopping BuildStream from doing that is the variety of different build systems in use, that there's no one way to get what are the file level dependencies, um, unless you force projects to rewrite their build systems, which obviously we don't want to do. What I do think is an interesting idea, though, is combining the tools like Rec, which can distribute and cache individual compiles, and integrating that into BuildStream. Currently, REC wouldn't work because in the sandbox, it can't speak to the remote execution API because there's no network access. Mm -hmm. But we chose that. Um, so the build stream itself could open up a, a hole in the sandbox purely for talking to the remote execution API. And you could then have these kind of two layers where build stream runs the configure script or whatever, sets up the build, and then from inside that sandbox, the, compi the individual compiles are distributed and cached. 
So I think that there is there is some interesting work to be done there. Yeah, so the, um, there is a feature which is workspaces, which goes some way to solving that. So if you're working on a large integration project and you want to focus on a specific component, you can use the workspace open command, and that will check out the, the source repo of the element, and it will give you a shell inside the sandbox where you can run make, run compilers, uh, modify the code. And it even has some support for doing incremental rebuilds in there. Um, so I've been told to stop, and that's made me lose my train of thought. <laughs> uh, but yeah, workspaces is, is, is the closest we have at the moment. But it is kind of expected as well that if you're working on a specific component, you maybe manually would set up a development environment for that. You'd run make and the tests separately, and then you'd go back to build stream in the CI or the integration stage. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot for coming, everyone. I uh, really appreciate it. And that's the end of the talk. <laughs>